and how they're interacting with each other. And of course, um, you can identify species that need conservation priority, uh, judging by how many you find over uh, several years. And while I was doing this, um, Operation Wallacea accepts uh, student volunteers who want to gain uh, fieldwork experience in the tropics, um, which is a really good thing because uh, it's quite hard for students to find that sort of experience um, elsewhere. And I sort of train them in the sort of identification techniques um, of how to identify various frogs, lizards, snakes, um, and also uh, survey techniques such as distance sampling, um, aguada surveys, and I'll explain what an aguada is in just a moment, and measuring morphometrics of the animals. Um, so what I mean by morphometrics is uh, the sort of various um body characteristics of different species uh which can be diagnostic in identification and so going into a bit more detail about where i was um so on the left here we have a general map of mexico and the sort of red icon shows where i was in the collectible biosphere of that we have in the uh, KP asteroid. Um, this is the this is whereabouts that asteroid hit, and it's thought that this asteroid uh, is the main cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs. So that's a, a fun fact about the region. And on the right, we have a more detailed view of the Yucatan Peninsula, in particular in Mexico, and Calakmul Biosphere Reserve is within the state of Campeche. Uh, at the sort of base of the peninsula where the sort of forested habitat is. And so most of the habitat within the reserve is known as semi-deciduous dry tropical forest. Um, and this basically means that uh, some of the trees are deciduous. So in the sort of winter months, uh, our winter months actually, the, some of the leaves of um, some of the trees will fall. Um, whereas some will stay throughout the year. Uh, but the further sort of southeast you go into the reserve, um, there's sort of a, a gradient of um, rainfall. It tends to rain more in this part of the reserve. And so you get more sort of lowland tropical rainforest, which remains greener throughout the year. And um, you sort of have these large uh, palm fronds, as you see in the bottom left pictures. And um, oh, I should have mentioned in the semi-deciduous uh, tropical forest, you get a lot of nice epiphytes. Uh, and epiphytes are plants that grow on other plants. And um, in the tropics is a good diversity of them. But uh, it seemed to be dominated by these lovely bromeliads, um, some which can be a very nice uh, pink colour there in the bottom right. <clears throat> and unfortunately, the um, oh, I'm not sure how to go back. There we go. Unfortunately, in recent years, the reserve has suffered from drought, <clears throat> and um, the the rain. There is a dry and a wet season, but the wet season, which occurs throughout the sort of summer months, um, the rain hasn't been uh, falling as much, and so um, this is really bad for the animals because. Um, especially amphibians and things that depend on moisture because they've been waiting all this time in the dry season for the rains to come and they're not ju they're just not coming. And so it's, it's difficult for um, those animals to make a living. And so, as I mentioned before, um, we surveyed aguadas, which is another sort of feature of the landscape. And they're, they're basically like large lakes and ponds, um, which are home to many reptiles, amphibians, uh, crocodiles, and vital sources of water for uh, the larger animals, such as jaguar and uh, various mammals. <coughs> and within the region, they're the only uh, water sources above ground. Uh, and that's because um, all of the rivers are roughly 100 metres underground. And the reason for that is because the Yucatan Peninsula is mostly made up of limestone. 
and um, the limestone is porous. Uh, so any rainfall that comes onto it, it will just seep through the rock and down into the rivers below. But what happens with these aguadas is where there's depressions in the limestone, um, you get an accumulation of leaves and um, sort of rotting vegetation. And that creates a sort of mucus layer, <coughs> which um, basically forms a plug in the limestone and it traps the water. And that's how the um, aguadas are formed. And as I've mentioned before, they're critical for the survival of uh, herpetofauna. Uh, that's just a fancy word for reptiles and amphibians. Uh, turtles and crocodiles. <coughs> and more let's crocodiles, <coughs> which is the main crocodile species <coughs> that occurs in the reserve in the uh, top image there. They um, can actually migrate for long distances throughout, th throughout the forest <coughs> to reach new bodies of water, particularly in the dry season, but with recent droughts, they're having to do it more often. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just going to take a drink. And so the region is well known for its... Um, human history as well. Um, so you may have heard the lions, um, <clears throat> which lived approximately 4,000 years ago. And they um, built the, the city in the forest, um, seemingly forest. independent of the rest of the world. <clears throat> it's one of the oldest civilizations going to occur. And you see... Um, on the left there, the sort of temples that they built are being reclaimed by the forest. But now they've become a sort of um, tourist attraction. And I actually went up some of these ruins and um, they're, they're really impressive. Um, they sort of go above the canopy and um, it makes you wonder how they built them with such limited resources. Uh, many people that live within the reserve, because um, there are villages within the reserve, uh, are descendants of this civilization. Uh, so it was quite fascinating talking to them. And the main Spanish, uh, the main, sorry, language in Mexico is Spanish. But in this region, uh, some people actually speak Mayan, which is a totally different language. Uh, and it's thought that these Mayan cities um, took approximately 14 centuries to build, which is quite remarkable, really. Um, and many of these ruins are still undiscovered. And you find new ones being discovered pretty frequently, even today. And you can see in the bottom left image, um, there's a lot of sort of carvings of certain animals within the forest. Uh, and it's thought that many of these civilizations had um, sort of affiliations with certain animals in the forest. And this one here is actually a snake, although it looks a bit strange, but... Um, you see the big head on the right and then the uh, serpent body going off to the left. <coughs> so, um, yeah, really fascinating human history. So I thought um, I'll go straight into the sort of highlights of what we found on these surveys for reptiles and amphibians. Uh, starting with this, which was on the front cover of the presentation. Uh, this is a type of snail-eating snail snake. Um, and so it almost exclusively feeds on mollusks. And um, they've actually evolved a sort of um, protein that they secrete from the floor of their mouth. For sure, put it on there if you want. <laughs> and this protein... Um, combats the mucus that the um, snail produces when it's under attack uh, and that makes it easier to extract it from the from the shell and they're often banded which is um, usually warning colors to predators <coughs> and um, it's just a really interesting snake and it's almost it's all, all, also endemic to the Yucatan Peninsula so you don't find it anywhere else in the world
And so this is quite a similar looking species. Um, uh, another type of snail eating snake. But um, the main sort of difference with the terrestrial snail sucker is that the bands are sort of more reddish in colour and the sort of band uh, closest to its head uh, reaches the eye, whereas it rarely does that in the other species. But of course, that can vary as it can with, um, as animals show variation patterning all the time. So the best way to differentiate them is to compare the um, <clears throat> the scalation on their heads, so the pattern of the scales, and the scale rows uh, that go across the middle of the body. So here we have um, an interesting bit of evolution. Um, on the left here, we have a venomous snake, and on the right, we have a non-venomous snake. And they look very similar, and there's a reason for this. <coughs> so um, there was an English naturalist called Henry Bates, who actually discovered um, uh, this sort of mimicry that some animals uh, perform to look like a dangerous animal that lives in the same environment as them. And is actually known as Batesian mimicry now. <coughs> and so this um, it's a type of king snake on the bottom right here, Amperopeltis abnorma. Um, and it's evolved exactly this to look like the highly venomous coral snake. And it's sort of North America and Mexico. It's um, there's like an old tale that uh, explains that if the yellow bands are touching red, then it's a dangerous snake. But if it's black touching red, then it's the non-venomous kind. Now, in North America <clears throat> and Mexico, um, this can can be accurate sometimes, but I wouldn't use it as a sort of rule of thumb because, as I said, uh, the patterns can vary within species and sometimes it can reverse. Mm. And so um, this is especially important if you go deeper into South America, into the Amazon, because you get more species um, that come in a vast array of colours and it just doesn't work. So I think it's um, red touches yellow kills a fellow, red touches black is a friend of Jack. <laughs> but um, I wouldn't use it. I don't think it's very accurate. It could be the last thing you do. Um, so the, the snake on the left, the variable coral snake, is um, a relative of the cobras. Uh, they, they're in the same family, the elapidae. And it's probably one of, if not the most toxic snake to humans uh, in this part of the world. But funnily enough, the king snake in the bottom right um, will actually eat other snakes, including the coral snake. So um, it, it's quite interesting how uh, it will mimic um, coral snakes, but um, to look more dangerous, but to the coral snake, it's a danger itself. <laughs> and so there's um, two types of blunt headed tree snake. Uh, this one, Imantodes gemistratus, and another one, Imantodes cancoa. Uh, gemistratus is actually um, the less common of the two. And uh, this is actually the only one we found on the trip. Uh, we saw lots of um, the other blunt-headed tree snake uh, in various parts of the reserve. But this is the only one that we found um, throughout two months being there. And uh, it's a really gorgeous snake. It's got these lovely green hues in between the uh, sort of black patterns on its, uh, on its body and this sort of ornate pattern on its head. And I remember this particular evening, we didn't find anything at all. And it was on the way back, uh, closer to camp. 
uh, that this one was crossing a, crossing a path. So quite unusual to see in that sort of situation because it is a sort of uh, arboreal snake. So it, it dwells in trees and bushes. But we found it just going along the ground, um, which is quite unusual. So this is a um, species that occurs throughout the Americas, uh, Central America in particular. And it's often found in and around caves. And it's a bit of an expert in catching bats. Um, of course, it will eat sort of anything you can get a hold of, but um, it's uh, you often find them around caves, at the sort of mouth of the cave. And um, at dusk, they sort of wait there, uh, poised to strike, waiting for the bats to come out of their roost. And um, there's quite a lot of videos online. Yeah, it's been well documented. Um, and you see them just snatching these bats out of the air. Um, often in complete darkness, which is quite amazing. Um, and they also have these amazing uh, sort of sky blue eyes, which my camera doesn't do it justice, but you just want to have to see it in person to to believe me. And it's quite a large snake. Um, this one we found was around three feet, uh, around a metre. And um, it was kind of bizarre. We were looking at um, this sort of cliff face within the jungle and there's these really narrow shelves on the limestone rock and it was right in front of us for about five minutes we didn't realize and it was sort of hugging this really tight shelf inching along uh, to get to the entrance of the cave and <clears throat> it's amazing what an animal with no legs can do um, and the sort of uh, agility it can show Uh, so this is probably one of the most bizarre animals I've seen um, in all my sort of travels around the world. Um, this is a Yucatan cascade frog. As its name suggests, you only find it in the Yucatan Peninsula. And it's sort of got this duck bill um, at the front of its head. And um, you see these sort of bumps in between its eyes, which give it the, the sort of cascade feature. And here's a sort of full body shot. Um, it is a, a tree dwelling frog. Um, but funny enough, it's uh, you, you often find it around human environments. So um, most of the ones I saw were in a sort of water tank um, within one of the less remote sites. And yeah, you see loads of them in there. Um, but when you actually go into the forest, you don't seem to see as many. Um, but I've got um, a little clip here to, whoops, to demonstrate what they sound like. So uh, we, we often heard this, you know, most nights when trying to sleep and it can be really, really loud. Um, so I'm just going to play that now. Uh, I'll play that again because I got it louder now. Oops. And I filmed that from probably about 10 meters from where the frogs actually were. <laughs> so uh, it can be quite deafening when you get close. So this is one we actually found in the forest, um, in its natural habitat. And the reason, well, one of the proposed theories as to why they have this bizarre head shape is that when they are hiding in tree crevices like this during the daytime <clears throat> and during the dry season, they use the head to uh, plug themselves into the crevice. And uh, this is a, well, thought to be a method of obtaining moisture um, during dry spells. And then when when night falls or when rain comes, uh, they can emerge to breed and do what they need to do. But uh, I don't think that's confirmed. It's sort of a theory. Um, but, uh, you know, the fact that we found one here 
<clears throat> just outside of a crevice. Uh, it was quite interesting. Um, and that's probably the only one we saw in that sort of position. <coughs> So another strange um, amphibian of the forest. Oh, uh, so they spend, um, this is a Mexican burrowing toad and they spend a great deal of their time underground. So they've got a sort of a stout fat body with short limbs, which is the idea of sort of um, design for burrowing. And you'll see many amphibians across the world who have a similar lifestyle will have this body structure <coughs> and um, this was <coughs> one of the nights where we actually had some rain which is quite unusual and you know when, when you get heavy rains in the wet season this is when you can get hundreds of them emerging at the same time uh, to breed and do what they need to do before uh, the rains disappear and um, you know, water bodies dry up and this one's a particularly pretty one. Um, they're not usually this sort of vibrant with the, the sort of red coloration. It's usually like a sort of deeper purple. <coughs> but um, if we look here, we've got a sort of side view of its tiny little head. <laughs> um, and then if we go on to the next slide, I do have this clip that I found online uh, of them calling. And if you refer to textbooks and things um some of them say it sounds a bit like human regurgitation <laughs> so i'm going to play the video now just so you can hear what they what they sound like when the rains come and collect them oh. hmm. um okay just bear with me a second um, I think at the end I'll come back to that and I'll just find <laughs> I'll find on the internet and play it because the link isn't working for some reason. So moving on, um, turtles, I didn't, didn't see too many turtles, but, but um, this is probably the most frequently seen species, uh, the furrowed wood turtle. <laughs> and if you look closely, it's actually got a, a parasite, a tick, attached to the outer edge of its shell next to the next to the front leg there and um if we zoom in it's actually bored through the shell oh. of the turtle um yeah. it's quite, quite amazing really um it's uh yeah. if you ever felt a turtle you know how sort of sturdy the shell is um but within the shell there's actually blood vessels so um, I guess these ticks have evolved particularly strong um, uh, sort of mouth parts or secretions to dissolve the shell and access um, a new food source. <laughs> you can see next to my thumb, it's quite a large tick as well. And I also noticed that they, they blend in quite well with the, the shell. Um, I don't know if that's a coincidence or um actually an adaptation um but almost every turtle you find uh in the reserve is carrying a tick they seem to be um <clears throat> a sort of favorite of the of the ticks for some reason <laughs> now the main crocodile that occurs in Kalakmul is the Moralets crocodile um if you go further to the coast you have um the American crocodile, which is a different species. But within the Kalakmul Biosphere Reserve, um, it's thought that <clears throat> it may contain one of the most one mm -hmm. of the most genetically pure populations of this species uh, in the world. And that's because in other parts of Central America and towards the coast, um, the sort of American crocodiles and the more or less crocodile live in close proximity <coughs> and uh, they can actually hybridize um, so you do get some hybrids in other parts of the um, of the continent um, but within Kalakmul they seem to be 
you know, better adapted to the limited water availability than the American crocodile. And so they remain genetically pure, as far as we understand. <coughs> and the reason I put local dog munch there is because um, the crocodile pictured here was living in a, a man-made iguana and uh, it was quite close to a village. And there was a local boy who um, we bumped into and he told us that the crocodile had been eating all of the dogs in the village. <clears throat> and so, well, well, we thought this was quite interesting, but if you look around the edge of the iguana in the sort of soft mud, you see a lot of dogs' footprints going into the water, but rarely any leaving the water. <laughs> <clears throat> so um yeah this is known as the um the local dog muncher and so probably two of the moist um flamboyant lizards you find in in the reserve are the smooth-headed basilisk and the helmeted basilisk um smooth-headed on the left because it has a smoother gradient to its crest <clears throat> whereas the helmeted has more of a sharp peak uh, the helmeted seems to prefer the sort of um, south, the sort of southern areas of the reserve where it's more, uh, it's more rainfall, it's a bit more tropical. Whereas the smooth headed, you seem to find in both the um, semi deciduous forest and the lowland tropical forest. Um, and often you'd find them uh, sleep, sleeping at night on a branch. In the day, they're actually quite difficult to get close to because they're more alert and uh, I think they often see you before you see them. But uh, real, real privilege to see these up close. Um, really lovely lizards. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> you can say that these are no lizards are like the reptile equivalent of the birds of paradise perhaps, because they involve these amazing colours on um, a flap of skin called a dewlap, which almost every animal has. Um, it's usually the female and old lizards that, uh, sorry, the male uh, and old lizards that have these dewlaps, but in some species, both sexes have it. And it's been, um, one of the diversity of them is driven by sexual selection, where males are, you know, evolving these flamboyant displays to attract females <clears throat> and in most cases it's the bigger and brighter the better and um you know this is a sort of radiated throughout the americas where these lizards occur and um they've become a really good sort of model organism for studying evolution and um you know coming across them they're probably the most common reptiles you see, but <clears throat> when you get them in the hand, you can really uh, appreciate what amazing animals they are. Um, I think my favourite is probably the um, ghost of Mel in the top left with that amazing blue spot in the middle. Uh, whereas the Tropodonotus in the top right and the Lemurinus in the bottom left, probably the most commonly seen. <laughs> and the, probably, the least common is probably the neotropical green and null in the bottom right. Um, I only saw one, and they're quite, um, they, they spend most of their time in the trees, so uh, it's difficult to get close to them. Um, it's probably the fastest snake I've ever seen, uh, the speckled racer. Um, in the name, it, it explains it really. Um, but if you want to catch a snake like this, it's one of the few you have to really run for. <laughs> um, they're exceptionally fast. Um, and it's kind of mind boggling to see how quickly they can move without any limb. Um, and of course they got this lovely uh, turquoise color. And you'd often see these, you know, on the forest floor, but they're gone within seconds and you can't get close to them. So um, it was good to get one in the hand. Um, and they get bigger than this and get up to about a metre. Uh, and a lovely 
another lovely reptile that um, I the only one I saw, Schwartz's skink, um, which uh, is as far as big as skinks go in the Americas. And um, we used uh, a trapping method. Wow. Uh, we use funnel traps, um, which is basically uh, a sort of mesh um, cylinder. At uh, each end of the cylinder, <clears throat> there's a small hole. And when reptiles go in, uh, for some reason, they find it quite difficult to find their way out. And so we, we plotted them throughout the forest. We check them every, every day. And uh, most of the time, we get nothing. <clears throat> but one day, we got a nice uh, Schwartz's skink, and it was really nice to see one in the hand. Um, so the two main geckos that uh, I came across were the Yucatan banded gecko in the top left. Um, it's quite similar to the uh, leopard gecko that you find in captivity quite often. <laughs> it's in the same family, actually, the Ubla faraday. And in that family, um, one of the main characteristics is that they have closable eyelids, whereas a lot of geckos, um, other gecko families don't. Um, so they can actually close their eyes. And um, you can see one in the bottom left there in the hand. It's quite a, quite a small species. Um, other Ubla geckos from around the world are uh, quite a bit larger. <clears throat> it's probably the most commonly seen gecko um, on night walks because they are, they are nocturnal. Uh, the one in the bottom left was actually uh, caught in one of those funnel traps that I explained. Um, this is actually a tiny, tiny reptile. Um, its adult size is around three centimeters. Um, and I'd actually have a common name. Uh, I'd call it dwarf gecko, but the latter name is Spherodactylus glaucus. <clears throat> Many Spherodactylus species from around the world are really, really small and sort of live in the leaf litter. Uh, this one is to found arborally. Um, they're often found in the sort of eaves of buildings within the reserve. <clears throat> but obviously, because they're so small, they're quite difficult difficult to detect. And I think um, this individual here has got an injury on its uh, left shoulder. I think it's got some scales missing where it may have escaped a predator in the past. Um, so some... You know, particularly interesting observations uh, regarding reptiles and amphibians were this um, uh, cat-eyed snake <coughs> uh, in one of the reserves further south, so in the more tropical zone. Um, when we found it, uh, we realised that it didn't have any fork on its tongue. Uh, we're not quite sure how this would have happened, um, but basically with the fork on the snake, its tongue is um, usually, usually its function is to um, direct the snake in uh, areas where the scent of food is stronger, for example. So if one of the prongs is collecting more scent molecules, it will go to the left, if it's the left prong, and vice versa. But it'd be interesting to know how a snake lives, you know, without a formed tongue. Um, and when I looked for literature on this subject, I couldn't really find much. So <clears throat> it'd be interesting to um, you know, see if there's any experimental evidence of whether this effect or not. And observations in the field are even more scarce. So quite an interesting thing to see. So we have um, another type of water body uh, called us Sartaneas, I believe that's how it's pronounced, and it's like a miniature iguana, uh, but more like a puddle that it collects in the limestone. And we actually found some tadpoles in this one here. Um, I believe they belong to the Mexican tree frog, uh, which is uh, quite a sim quite a common species. But <clears throat> you know, the use of these these water bodies is quite um, under documented. So it was uh, interesting to come across that. And that was about it for um, the sort of highlights of reptiles and amphibians. Um, 
I could have gone into more detail, but I would be able to fit in the other stuff. Um, so going on to the other wildlife highlights, um, probably, oops, probably the most um, heard animal in the forest is the Yucatan black howler monkey. Um, you get howler monkeys <coughs> across the Americas and down into the Amazon. Um, but I believe this is a subspecies <coughs> that you only find in the Yucatan Peninsula. And they're usually jet black. Um, whereas in other parts of their range, they can be a sort of um, injury sort of brown colour. And I've got some videos here that I took while I was out there. Um, the first one will be a sort of first person view of walking through the habitat and hearing these howler monkeys. And before I play the video, they are, I believe they are the, lo the loudest land animal officially. So it's quite an amazing sound. I'm just going to play it now. Sounds more like a dinosaur than a monkey. <laughs> um, and this one is um, sort of a first person view of walking through the forest. And you hear them howling in the morning. <coughs> Looks like a scene from Jurassic Park. <laughs> oh, I should say, um, the reason they howl is, uh, I believe it's troops howl together from certain vantage points in the forest <coughs> um, in order to mark their territory to other troops. Uh, and I believe they try to go as high as they can so the sound emits further across the, across the land. But even from the village, um, the nearby village at this particular site, you know, quite far away from the forest, <coughs> you can still hear them even uh, from miles away. So it's uh, one of the most spectacular sounds you can hear in nature, I think. Uh, and the other primate species that you can get um, living you next to the howler monkey is the Yucatan spider. And I believe um, this is another subspecies that you only find in the Yucatan Peninsula. <laughs> and in, in some parts of the reserve, um, the monkeys have been, you know, kind of bit by research in the past. So at one site uh, where I took the bottom left photo, actually, uh, the monkeys don't mind the human presence. See. So get quite close to them. they're literally i don't know five meters above you in a tree i don't mind but if you go to other parts of the reserve where they're not habitualized uh they can be quite mischievous and um they'll throw sticks at you they'll poop on you they'll urinate on you <laughs> um sometimes you think uh you hear rain coming down from the canopy but it's actually a monkey above you peeing on you um so yeah, they're quite uh, cheeky monkeys, as it were. Uh, going on to birds, um, the collared aracari or arasari, uh, quite commonly seen throughout some parts of the reserve. Um, they have this like amazing serrated bill, uh, which I believe is used for cracking open nuts and seeds. Oh, uh, this, yeah. <laughs> this particular photo actually um, makes it look a bit deformed. It looks like it has a giant head and a small body, but it's just the <laughs> angle of the photo. I can assure you this one was uh, proportionate. And then I don't think any sort of creature epitomizes the tropics better than the Tugans. This Kill Bill Tugan that you find throughout Central America. <clears throat> and probably... 
yeah, probably my favorite bird from the trip. Um, in uh, at one particular site that we um, we worked in, there you can get quite close to them. They like to feed on Cecropia seeds, and uh, if you sit by one of those Cecropia trees for a while, um, especially in the morning or at dusk, uh, they'll come in sort of small flocks and feed right in front of you, which is how I got this photo. And one thing I didn't notice before is that they got these amazing sort of turquoise feet, um, which is quite an interesting feature. I'm not sure if there's a function to that or not, but uh, yeah, lovely. Um, and so this black vulture uh, was seen uh, dwelling on some of the Mayan ruins. Uh, this species is found throughout Central and South America. Um, but to get this close to one is quite unusual. Um, and you can see uh, it sort of looks like an undertaker of the natural world. Um, that's pretty much what it is. You know, it's probably waiting for, you know, a carcass to appear nearby. <clears throat> oh, and I should have mentioned that um, around some of the mine ruins, um, they can actually be a wildlife hotspots because Mine when the mines live that. there, uh, some... Some, I haven't uh, got one. That was the last one. You have it. I've oh, not got this. I'm gonna see. Uh, some wood plants. Um, um, I think it's trees around the uh, temple. And some of those trees are still there today. And they still fruits. It attracts a lot of monkeys and things, and of course, they're predators. So at, at one of the sites. Probably the the less remote site that we worked in. Um, there was a uh, sort of museum uh, next to where we were camping, a really small museum for sort of um, ecotourism purposes. But sort of uh, on the museum, you'd often find falcons, uh, bat falcons perched, and there was actually a family there. They don't just eat bats; um, we sort of eat dragonflies and all kinds of things. Um, but they're probably <clears throat> best known for in uh, sort of waiting at bat roosts and waiting for bats to emerge. And among a lot of other raptors, they'll actually just fly in and pick off the bats as they emerge. <clears throat> and in Kalakmul, there's um, a particular area where it has one of the biggest bat emergencies in the world. And, um, you know, you'll often see these bat falcons there alongside eagles and all sorts of things uh, but this uh, particular individual seemed you know really used to people and it was perched on a sort of uh, a sort of pillar underneath the roof of um, <coughs> the outside of the museum and they just didn't didn't care about my presence so that was quite a unique opportunity to see that up close Going into the small stuff, um, this is a red cap mannequin, um, and it's probably best known for its mating ritual. So this is a male uh, with the bright red head, and if you look closely, it has um, these yellow fluffy trousers. Quite a spectacular looking bird. <coughs> um, it's probably um, a bit smaller than a robin, perhaps. And I'm hoping this next video works, otherwise I'll have to play at the end. Uh, but they actually do a sort of moonwalk dance along the branch. Um, let's just see if this works. Hi. Looks like I have to exit full screen to play videos. Um, should be loading up.
So that's the male red mannequin um, doing its mating dance. And while I'm here, I'll see if I can play the Mexican burrowing toad call. Yeah, it looks like it's going to work. Just give it a moment. And that's the call of the Mexican burrowing toad that I tried to play earlier. <clears throat> right, let's go back to full screen. Uh, continuum of birds, we have a these red-legged honey creepers. Um, believe it or not, they're the same species. That's just the female on the left. <clears throat> and the sort of red-legged honey creeper name basically refers to the male, um, which as you can see is a gorgeous bird. Uh, quite common, but difficult to get photographed of. Uh, woodpeckers occur throughout the reserve. Um, probably the most common is this lineated woodpecker. And at sort of dusk, um, these white fronted parrots would uh, congregate in very large flocks to come and feed on um, the seeds and fruits of the trees. <coughs> That's the best time to see them. And um, like most parrots, uh, I believe they mate for life. Um, so they're very um, sort of advanced birds uh, cognitively. And so if you remember the uh, baits in Mirapri I described between the coral snake and um, the king snake uh, in a previous slide, this bird, the turquoise browed mop mop, was the one of the two bird species in which um, we're used to test the sort of a uh, theory of baits in mimicry. Um, I can probably provide more details on that paper if you want to read it. But these are the first birds that sort of um, were used to, you know, show evidence that um, the mimicry does work. Um, and it just so happens that they're one of the most beautiful birds you can find in the reserve. And uh, this is probably the only, I think this is the only photo I got of a uh, mop mop, but um, if you were to video it, um, it sort of sits there and swings its tail feathers from side to side like a pendulum, uh, which is quite characteristic of them. Uh, but yeah, really gorgeous bird. And um, it's a shame we didn't see more really. Uh, and this fella here is a Yucatan parrot. Um, this one you only find in the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, so it's quite a special find. <clears throat> Often these will flock with the white-fronted parrots in the previous slide. And it's quite dif difficult to um, pick them out of a flock. But this one was on its own. Um, and the sort of berries that it's feeding on there um, are from the tree of a Chichen, a Chichen tree. Uh, and chichen trees are highly poisonous to humans. <clears throat> Even contact with the leaves can cause um, severe rashes in some people. Uh, but if you were to eat the berries, that'd be a very bad idea. But to the parrots, um, they seem to love them and it doesn't affect them in that way. And so um, <clears throat> it's quite an interesting find. Um, this is an opossum. Uh, which is a marsupial. And uh, I'm not entirely sure what kind of a possum it is, but if you look around its um, sort of stomach area between its hind legs, it has a pouch, um, just like a kangaroo, where, where the young are sort of kept. Um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people associate marsupials with Australia, uh, but they actually originate from South America, these sort of... Um, 
you know, the earliest marsupials in the fossil record. <clears throat> and the early marsupials would look a lot like this opossum, most likely. Um, and recent research has found that there are sort of marsupial fossils in Antarctica. And that sort of answers the question as to how they got to Australia, because once upon a time, um, there was a landmass called Gondwana, which is where most of the major landmasses were connected. So um, South America and Australia were connected to Antarctica. And I believe back then Antarctica was actually a sort of um, like temperate forest environment. And so as the marsupials evolved in South America and diversified and spread throughout the continent, they reached Antarctica. And they did the same thing along Antarctica until they reached Australia. And then from there, um, they seem to fulfill more niches in Australia than anywhere else in the world, which is why you get so many, um, so many different types there. So that's quite interesting. Um, I learned that from, it was a lecture when I was a seminar when I was uh, studying in Bristol. Um, I can't remember the name of the chap, but, um, I could probably fish out that particular paper if anyone is interested. Um, cause I, I thought it was fascinating. Um, yeah, there we have it, the origin of marsupials. And so you'd often see signs of this animal, um, and you've probably heard of tapirs. Uh, I believe this is most likely Baird's tapir. Um, and this is a footprint I found <coughs> at the edge of one of those aguadas that I've mentioned, uh, probably taking a drink. And they have this distinctive... Um, sort of three-toed footprint. There's nothing quite like it in the tropics. Um, unlikely to confuse it with anything else. And as you can see next to my hand, it's quite a big animal. Um, but for you know, such a large animal, it can remain very elusive. And, um, you know, we didn't see any, I didn't expect to see any, but it just, it's amazing how the larger animals seem to be harder to find um, in Kalakmul. And I believe um, there was a recent observation, I think it was in, within Clackmore, that, um, of a jaguar hunting and killing one of these tapirs. And I think that's the first record of this um, in the reserve, uh, possibly within the region. So it's amazing what goes on in nature um, and what you don't see. So going on to the insects quickly, <clears throat> it's probably one of the most spectacular insects of the trip. Uh, the the common name I made up because I, I don't I'm not sure if it has a common name, <clears throat> but it's Fulgora latinaria, the peanut headed lantern bug, um, and it's uh, quite closely related to the um, the plant hoppers uh, that we get in the UK, but just a lot bigger and a bit more flamboyant. You might add. And it has this amazing sort of projection that looks a bit up on the top of its head. Um, what that's for, I, I don't know, and I'm not sure if anyone else does, but um, it's quite a spectacular insect. And if you look in the bottom left, you'll see how big it is um, on human hand. So maybe about the size of a stag beetle, perhaps. And to the far left, um, when you pick it up by its peanut, it um, flashes these uh sort of eye patterns which i would imagine is a a defense um you know a bit like uh what some butterflies have so yeah a really uh spectacular animal <coughs> there are many um praying mantis species throughout the reserve um but probably the the most um memorable one is this south american dead leaf mantis or acanthops um, and as you can see on my hand there, it, the resemblance to a dead leaf is quite remarkable. It even has the sort of um, the veination that a leaf would have and the sort of broken chunks missing. I mean, if that was on the forest floor, you'd have a job to see it, wouldn't you? But luckily, this one was actually perched on a palm uh, above the forest floor, so it was stood out quite easily. 
and a macro photo reveals these amazing purple eyes with these sort of horns on top of them. Um, so yeah, just a really, really amazing animal. And just a few other insects of um, particular interest. So starting from the left, we have a cicada, which is molting. So quite a lot of cicadas, they spend most of their life as a nymph underground, um, feeding on the roots of trees and things. And, you know, in some species, it can take decades for them to, um, to emerge. Uh, not sure what species this is, but I was lucky to see it. They had just emerged and was molting into its final form, so a winged adult. And you can see the pink um, <coughs> sort of flaps to the side of it. Those are the wings that will eventually be pumped full of um, blood or hemolymph, as, as it's known in invertebrates, and they'll expand um, and they'll be able to fly. Um, and they're very noisy as well. You may have seen, um, you know, on David Attenborough documentaries and things like that, how, how noisy they can be. Uh, but yeah, quite a lucky moment to see one reaching its final form. <clears throat> to the right of that, we have a robber fly eating a spider. So it seems the roles are reversed here. We have a fly eating a spider, which is quite unusual. Um, and that spider is an orb weaving spider. So I have a suspicion that that robber fly plucked it from its web, um, which would have been quite amazing to see. Uh, and you can see it's holding on by just two legs at the top there on the leaf while it uh, sucks the insides of this spider out. To the right, we have a roosting orchid bee. Um, like the many of the solitary bees we get in the UK, they clamp their mandibles onto a piece of vegetation at night, and that's how they sleep. Um, but this one is uh, they're about the size of a bumblebee, and most orchid bees are like this amazing metallic green color um, so it was great to see one um, up close and get a photo because usually you can't get near them during the day in the bottom left this ferocious looking animal is the larvae of an owl fly um, and an owl fly is um, I should put a photo of the adult in really but it looks a bit like a butterfly um, but it's a completely different um, order of insect <clears throat> and the larvae are usually predatory and you can tell by um so that's the head at the bottom and it's got these amazing uh mandibles that are open to almost 180 degrees and they snap shut when they um when prey comes in striking distance and they've also got these amazing plumed uh appendages all around all around the edge of their body um i would imagine they're sensory but i'm not 100 percent sure about that uh, but yeah, really spectacular thing. To the right of that, we have a saddleback caterpillar. <coughs> um, I believe this turns into, um, you know, quite a, a brown job of a moth. <laughs> so uh, in this case, the caterpillar is more spectacular than the moth. <coughs> and um, I actually found this because it stung me as I brushed past it in the forest. I felt this um, sort of sharp pain in my arm. Um, I was slightly worried it was a snake, but uh, it turned out to be this caterpillar and had a bit of an itchy sensation, but nothing too bad. But I've heard that some people can get quite severe rash, rashes from these caterpillars, so I was quite lucky. Yeah, really remarkable, remarkable insect. Um, and finally, in the bottom right, we have an assassin bug, um, which has just caught a longhorn beetle. Uh, and it's grabbed it by the antennae and I saw it dragging it across the path, which was quite amazing. Uh, assassin bugs are quite closely related to um, uh, like shield bugs that we get in the UK, um, except these are predatory. Although I do believe we get a couple of predatory shield bugs in the UK. Um, but this is a quite a large insect, um, probably around four or five centimetres. <coughs> so it was really cool to see that. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to go through some outstanding arachnids. So, um, in the top left there, we have a net casting spider. Uh, so they they make a literally make a net that they throw over their prey. 
Um, so they have these amazing large eyes, um, which are really sensitive and low light. And they can see, you know, insects movement um, in the darkness that we can't see. And so uh, when an insect comes underneath it, you see it's uh, casted over a leaf there. It will literally throw it in there. Uh, onto the insect and wrap it up and eat it. Quite amazing, really. Um, to the right of that, we have a <clears throat> jumping spider in the Lysomanes genus. Um, many of these um, spiders are green and they have these uh, amazing masks, if you like, um, of colour on their face. And a bit like the anoles, the anole lizards I mentioned previously, um, They've evolved these colors to signal to mates. Um, so they're one of the few spiders that can um, that have, uh, you know, complex enough vision to do uh, courtship displays. <coughs> and you may have seen that in peacock spiders from Australia, but um, many jumping spiders do this. And uh, this is a fine example. To the right, we have a wolf spider. Um, <laughs> it's probably like a giant version of the wolf spiders you get in your garden in the spring in the springtime. This was probably around the size of a house spider, um, and yeah, they're quite common throughout the reserve, and you see them pretty much every night. To the bottom left, this bizarre creature is a whip scorpion um, in the order Amblypygii. Uh, they look pretty ferocious, but they're actually harmless. They don't have any venom, as far as we know. Um, and I've actually kept one of these in captivity, and it's a real joy to watch at nighttime. <coughs> but you can see they have these really extra long appendages, which are used for feeling around in the darkness, because they they either live in caves or come out at nighttime in the forest. And for those Harry Potter fans, you may have seen this in a scene uh, where I believe it's like Mad Eye Moody or something. Um, cast a spell that put, puts one on Ron's head. <laughs> so, also known as the Harry Potter spider. Um, I should also mention that it's not a scorpion or a spider. The Amblypie guy is its own order of arachnid. So they're they're completely separate from them. Then to the right we have a huntsman spider with a weevil, um, and then to the right of that we have. Uh, various tarantulas that we had, uh, most of them you see in camp. Um, yeah, not good for the arachnophobes, but for someone like me, uh, quite a joy to have. <coughs> so um, I did mention that I am a, I'm a member of the Amtronala White Amphibian and Reptile Group, and there's an unlikely link here. So uh, through student interaction and... Um, you know, giving presentations about um, conservation to mainly students from the UK. Um, I talked about the uh, sort of work of the, the reptile group in Hampshire. And um, I'd just like to say now that for everyone who's listening, um, the group welcomes people to get involved with um, reptile and amphibian surveys around Hampshire and uh, to engage in sort of public engagement events and things like that. Um, so if you're interested in um, finding out more about that, uh, just contact me after the talk or put, put a question in the chat. Um, but basically what I'm getting at here is that there's a student here on the Mexico trip who was studying at Southampton University. And um, we got talking and, you know, I was quite amazed that, um, you know, what are the chances of meeting someone who's living in Southampton in Mexico? <clears throat> and so we got talking about, um, you know, the reptile group and how it helps students to get experience um, in sort of ecological surveys and things. And it's eventually led to me uh, visiting Southampton University uh, with another member of HIWAG uh, to give a presentation um, just to raise awareness about what uh, what the group does and how the students can get involved and we had you know quite a lot of student interest um leading up to the 2020 uh season uh but unfortunately the pandemic hit and so um 
it was a real shame we couldn't get those students out uh, to to sort of train them in how to survey these animals. Um, so we hope to, you know, do that this year if possible, but certainly in the future. Um, and this doesn't just apply to students. Um, doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, how old you are, uh, you can get involved. So um, just uh, drop me a message if you're interested. Uh, and that's about it from me. Um, yeah, it's. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, There's probably quite a lot of stuff I might have missed that you have questions about, so I'll be happy to take them uh, whenever you're ready.